I'm Veronica, the senior lecturer in the School of Nursing, the University of Hong Kong. I'm also responsible for the stimulation education development. The topic that I'm going to present today is related to using various simulation activities to enhance students' learning and competence. The outline of this presentation, initially, I think we can have some good discussion about common types of simulation activity used in nursing education, identify the strengths and weaknesses of various simulation activities, discuss the use of IPE interprofessional education simulation to enhance students' learning, and also share our experience in conducting various simulation activities. Unfortunately, this presentation cannot be face-to-face. -face. Therefore, the discussion part cannot be conducted. Why we need to use simulation in nursing education? We all know that because one of the most important reasons is it is a kind of participative learning. Students really participate in that learning process. It is applicable for junior year student to senior year student and even to those graduated nurse. For junior year students, we might use the low fidelity and mid fidelity simulator more than the high fidelity. But for senior year students, we might use the high fidelity simulator more to enhance their clinical reasoning and critical thinking. Simulation in education also allows students to learn from a safe, protected, controlled environment before working in a real arena. A lot of studies report that simulation in nursing education can promote students' critical thinking, encourage students to think thoughtfully before they really apply what they learned to the scenario, engage interaction by students, enhance students' communication skills, and also allow students making mistakes and learn without the fear of harming a patient. Definitely, there are more and more advantages we can use simulation in nursing education. We need to remember that simulation, simulation teaching is not equal to the use of high fidelity simulator for teaching. Let me share with you about the common types of simulation activity that we use in the School of Nursing. We use task trainers, that is the low fidelity to mid fidelity simulators, mainly is to enhance students' clinical, uh, skill competence to develop students' psychomotor skills. We use screen-based computer. We use screen-based computer mainly is to prepare our students before they participate in clinical practicum. It is an activity that students interact via multimedia applications such as animation and video, graphics, sounds, vision, and text through the advanced web offering tool. Some research document that screen-based simulation can be used effectively in improving students' confidence in their ability to perform psychomotor skills. And also, it can be for mental rehearsal, improving students' clinical performance before they really go out to clinical. That is why we use the screen-based computer for students. We take it as a practical activities. This is a variable resources that can be used in combination with traditional form of laboratory and classroom teaching in order to facilitate the development of students' clinical competency and critical thinking. It got the disadvantages as well. Some commercial screen-based computer program is not tailor-made for your course. So you might not be able to meet your objective. And this activity, students engage in it for one time, two time, or even three times, then they know the cue, 
they know what's happened in the next, and then they might lost their interest. High fidelity simulation. We all know that high fidelity simulation can increase students' crit critical thinking, improve their communication skill, and also we can, as a facilitator, we can write up our own scenario and then input it in the simulator. But at the very beginning, if you are not, are not familiar with the software, it's not easy for you to write up the scenario and input it. Sometimes after you write it up and put in the scenario, put the scenario in the simulator, and then you turn on the simulator, sometimes you may not come up with what you want. So it takes time for you to try run for before you really put it on, uh, put this activity to your students. Furthermore, high fidelity simulation teaching need resources and skill to create a, a almost real life situation. And the deficit, another deficit is not all situation can be created, and not every situation can be simulated. High fidelity simulation teaching is quite expensive and the simulator, the software, and even though the hardware are requires constant update and maintenance. It requires intensive manpowers, the manpowers to operate the simulator, the manpower to facilitate the activity, the IT support. It requires continuous training for the teacher and facilitator. Some students, they are not willing to learn from their mistake. And some may not easily engage in the scenario. Probably, they may not process the ability to emerge. So as a facilitator, as a simulation teaching educator, we also need to think how to make the scenario real, how to make the environment real, how to make the equipment well and how to, if you got the act, since standardized vision or you got the actors, how to make everything real, make the person looks real and so that the student can engage in the scenario. Standardized vision, I believe Quite a number of institutions, universities, they use standardized patients a lot. We also use a lot of standardized patients and we call a pool of standardized patients. Standardized patients provide a high rhythm for students to practice and students can practice communication skill, interper interpersonal relationship. But as standardized patient, we might give a script to a standardized patient and we need to train up the standardized patient and the student give reading to the standardized patient. And not every standardized patient might be easy to follow what you say. They may have some rarities. If you use standardized for assessment, it may be the point that we need to focus. And standardized patients also got the disadvantage in nursing education because they are quite pricey. It is not easy to recruit them. And then we also have virtual reality. VR is more and more common in nursing education. VR can increase the realism and Especially according to many studies, you mentioned PR is a very, a very good tool to improve students or enhance students' empathy. But develop a PR is quite uh, tedious. It's not only because it is an it is expensive. It's also it got you need to a lot of preparation from write up a script. Write up the conversation for each actor or actress. Find a place to, to do the videoing. And editing. And at the end, how you 
what kinds of means you, you, you can use to, for students to access the VR. All these are the, not the problem, but all these are the issue that we need to consider. I had experience in conducting two 360-degree VR. Same as what I mentioned, starting from I write up the script, get the help from the actors, and then train up the actors. The actors need to remember the script and then redoing. We do the editing. And then I need to consider from in where I can show the VR to the students. In a VR cave, in a VR do, or in the classroom. If it is a 360 degree video, a classroom is fine. A right? student can put on the uh, 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 Google box and then put the, uh, uh, their mobile phone in it. And then they can watch the VR. But students usually not much satisfied with a 360 degree VR. Because nowadays the commercial VR is quite advanced. Students like that they have, can have interactive uh, uh, um, element with the VR. So how to do it? Currently, I'm developing a interactive VR, and now it's still in process. We use VR to. Hopefully, a student can use VR to do a, a psychomotor skill. And now I'm still thinking how to let the student access the VR once when it is ready. Because it is not like a 360 degree video. All students can sit in the class and then watch it. Interactive VR, it must be each student, may they have action. So it must be one by one. How to entertain the 250 students or 210 students in the VR is also an issue that I need to think about. But although it is difficult, but the advantage of VR cannot be excluded. So high fidelity simulation and standardized patients seems to be more common nowadays being used in uh, nursing education. We always heard about theory and practice gap, right? We try to input a lot of theory which, uh, with a lot of examples so that to practice the gap. We use the lab practice so that students uh, can practice what they learn, especially the skills, so we hope we can bridge the gap. We engage students in clinical practicum. We hope students can really bring what they want or what they learned in the kin in, in lectures to the clinical site. And we adopt the simulation teaching. Is that enough to bridge the theory and practice gap? Yes, it can, but the gap's still there. So why the gap's still there? It is because there's some concern from the real arena. Nursing is not a single profession. We need help from other professions so as to restore the, our patients' health. So nurse and doctor need to cooperate. Nurse and pharmacy need to cooperate. Nurse and nurse need to cooperate. And a lot of studies also report that poor communication, poor communication between professions of different specialists might lead to some adverse incidents in healthcare arena. So how to deal with that? Can simulation activity help it? Simulation activity, if it is not for interprofessional, it can improve the communication, but it's within the same professions. So, Nowadays, simulation activity expand from a single professions to interprofessions. I know this uh, uh, cartoon. It mentioned that in nurses, physio, life science, uh, 
paramedic medicine, how can they work together if they don't learn together? In Faculty of Medicine, Hong Kong U, we many, many years ago, we already developed the interprofessional education. What is interprofessional education? This is an occasion when two or more professions learn with, from and about each other to improve collaborations and quality of care. So in our faculty, more than 15 years, we started to use what we call patient care project. Initially, we started with um, two nursing students matched with one or two medical students. They recruited the patients and then visit the patients at home or in hospital. And they try to understand the patients who have chronic illness and then how they this group of patients encounter stress what are their roles change after they got a chronic illness and what is the perception of the patient or client to the medical and nurses and nowadays this patient care project has been extended it's not only the medical students and nursing students we also include the chinese medicine students and pharmaco pharmacology or and pharmacy students so that they group together and recruit the patient and try to the, understand a patient's role of sick. We also got another interprofessional education that is various disciplines they sit together and then they learn the cases together. We usually conduct it in Saturday because uh, it's hard to find the timetable for all disciplines available. But it's not together equal to work together. Definitely not. We implement interprofessional education, but the theory and practice gap still there. Therefore, we add in is interprofessional simulation education and VR and AR. Hope it can help to minimize the gap between theory and practice. We hope the interprofessional education and healthcare simulation, this field can really promote the, in future the nurses, doctors, pharmacy, they all work together well in the clinical area. According to some studies, they reveal that interprofessional simulation education enhances interprofessional communications, team collaborations, self-confidence, efficacy, leadership, appreciation of the team, influence patient safety, and quality of care. A study also mentioned that the majority uh, the outcome of interprofessional simulation education is related to increased confidence, knowledge, leadership, teamwork, and communication skill. So there are two interprofessional simulation education I would like uh, experience that I would like to share with you. One is CRM IPE TPL simulation education. Activity. It seems to be, the term seems to be a long term. Right? It is Christ Resources Management Interprofessional Education Team Based Learning Simulation Activities. This project developing and evaluating interprofessional blended team based learning and clinical simulation education in medical and, surgical and nursing curricula. Our objective is to deliver the interprofessional clinical education to medical and nursing students through team-based learning and clinical simulation. We would like to evaluate the effectiveness of the team-based learning, to evaluate the effect of sim clinical simulation and understand the student experience and satisfaction. The intervention is all students, they got one hour classroom in team-based learning followed by two-hour clinical simulation with two standardized scenarios. 
These are the medical students and nursing students after their one hour classroom in team based learning about crisis resources management and then they applied it to a scenario. It is a pilot study, so the subject actually, the number of subjects is more, is about uh, uh, 19 medical students and 27 nursing students, and we also got one pharmacy students. We measure the teamwork, we measure the perception of team based learning, we measure the team performance. So the assessor is from one ex expert doctor and one nurse, both are the external, not our own teachers. From this activity, we find out students recognize the importance of teamwork, especially attitude. It is effective in undergraduate training to improve their technical skill because they need to learn how to work together. But because it is a pilot study, we would like to have a full scale in future. And we would like in long term, we can have a follow up, a longitudinal follow up uh, for the students after they graduate, uh, they work in the clinical, whether this activity can help them or not. Another activity related to the interprofessional simulation activity is the IPS interprofessional simulation related to pharmacology activities. The objective of this activity is to enhance nursing and pharmacy students' drug knowledge and enhance the communication between nursing and pharmacy students. So nursing students will engage in two scenarios and then that two scenarios definitely got some problem and the pharmacy students will give advice to the nursing students. So our participants is, we got 27 pharmacy students and 168 nursing students they engage in two cases. The nursing students give medication to the patient. And if they got problem encounter, they need to consult the pharmacy students. The comment, overall students like this activity. And nursing students also find that pharmacy students are well equipped with knowledge, which helped the nursing student to deal with the medication stuff. And this activity also assists the nursing student to enhance their drug knowledge as well. We also encounter some problem related to the interprofessional simulation, not only the ph uh, pharmacology simulation activity, because time is all, always a problem because, uh, related to the time schedule and the availability of time to a large number of students. So if we, we would like to run a successful interprofessional simulation, there are some tips. First is focus on interprofessionals. Ensure the learning outcomes focus on enhancing interprofessional knowledge, behavior, and attitudes, but not from particular professions. We develop the scenario that are relevant for all related professions. Second, anticipate a complex logistic ar arrangement. As what I mentioned, it's not easy to find a schedule, a date or a time that all students are, are available. So we usually conduct it in, on Saturday. And we also need to consider the budget, the manpower and resources. We need to balance the diversity with equity because they always have some hierarchy relationship. So we need, by the time when we write up the scenario, we need to balance it out. And the, for the facilitator, we must ensure it's sufficient representative between professions. We need to set up a clear ground rule to the students. Usually we do it in, at the pre-breathing section. And we focus on assess, assessment of the team, but not each individual. We need to aware that the interprofessional debriefing challenge because uh, we when we do the debriefing, it's better to have them, each profession should have one facilitator. Just like if we got a, a group of medical students and nursing students, we will have a facilitator to do the debriefing. 
who is a doctor and also also have one who uh, uh, who is a, a nurse. And if we are not familiar with interprofessional simulation education, it's better to look for and work with the IPSE, the Interprofessional Simulation Education Followers. And the simulation education followers always lead, uh, not followers, the interprofessional simulation educators or facilitators always need support. So we need to provide training to them. And we also take opportunity to foster the research as well. To end this presentation, I would like to, uh, uh, to call the uh, conclusion from one of the nursing, uh, the nursing journal. You mentioned that simulation-based nursing education intervention has strong educational effect, with particularly large effect in the psychomotor domain. Since the effect is not proportional to fidelity level, it is important to use a variety of education intervention to meet all the educational goals. So we cannot focus on one particular level of fidelity and provide the activity with that uh, uh, to the students. We need to use various type of fidelity simulator to help us to meet the educational goal and help the student to get the competency. Sorry, there's no Q&A questions. If you got any question, you can please feel free to email me. Thank you very much.